Water therapy used for recovery across a variety of different temperatures, so hot, cold, oh. Oh. or even the combination of both of these is one of the most common forms of recovery that anybody will have ever heard of. However, while it may be very common across sports, in terms of sports science, it is one of the most conflicting forms of recovery. And today's paper is going to take a look at a couple of these methods combined. So this week's paper is titled Effects of Water Immersion Methods on Post-Exercise Recovery of Physical and Mental Performance. And this is coming to us from Mid-Sweden University in Sweden. So what we had was we had a couple of different water immersion therapies and a group of nine males. So the water immersion therapies we had were cold water immersion, hot water immersion, thermoneutral water, and then contrast water therapy. So contrast water therapy is obviously just a combination of hot and cold uh, alternating immediately after one another. So what we had was a group of nine physically active men, and then they were randomly assigned to each one of these groups or an active recovery group, which was in the terms of this study was our kind of control group. So what we had was the groups performed physical exercise and um, just have this on the screen there to see so you can see what they were performing. So it was basically just they basically wanted to cause enough muscle damage that you would see some kind of results if anyone was to do this kind of physical exercise. So what they did was they performed this physical exercise. Prior to this, then they had some baseline testing done on their 30 meter sprint isometric leg press and then counter movement jump. Uh, funnily enough, the isometric leg press were not published in the study for some reason, and they didn't specify why. So everyone involved in the study did each one of these therapies following the same exercise protocol, and then these uh, tests were separated by two weeks. So what they had was they did the exercise protocol, and then a variety of different measurements, hormonal, psychological, and then some neuromuscular measurements were recorded at different intervals post the study. So they're pretty numerous, so I won't waste time naming them out, but... Essentially, these were things like uh, hemoglobin, uh, hematocrit, uh, serum creating kinase, which is usually typically used as a mo uh, measure of muscle damage. We had cortisol, testosterone, and then a couple of neurotransmitters, so epinephrine and neuroepinephrine. So these are typically involved in a variety of different kind of um, symptomatic nervous system protocols. So things like releasing glycogen from your liver, uh, heart rate, blood pressure, all these useful things involved in exercise. And so these are useful to measure post-exercise protocols and then specifically do these alter after we apply any different kind of recovery methods. So just a, a particular note on the specifics of what they did for the immersion therapy. So for the cold water immersion therapy, thermoneutral or hot water immersion therapy, what they did was they sat in the bath for 10 minutes. Uh, so all groups actually did an active recovery immediately post the exercise. So they did a, basically a 10 minute cool down where they drank 40 grams of protein plus 40 grams of carbohydrates, I should say, and 20 grams of protein. So the active recovery group also did this, but then they sat in the bath for 10 minutes, an empty bath, just to keep things consistent, while the other groups then applied their various water immersion therapies, depending on what group and what stage they were at in the study. So following their application of the exercise protocol, when they did their hot water or cold water or whatever therapy they were doing, three days following that, then they had a follow-up of the test. So they did their 30 meter sprint, uh, counter movement jump, and then some psychological evaluation. Okay, in terms of results, what happened? Was there any effect? For significance anyway, for the performance markers, there is no significant difference between any of the recovery methods. So across all four methods, no significant difference in 30 meter sprint time following the recovery or counter movement jump following the recovery. There was a large effect size for thermoneutral water uh, immersion and active recovery for both 30 meter sprint and counter movement jump. But again, none of this is significant. So it's something we're going to talk about later on is where do we kind of judge significance in terms of our statistical data? But very much for this study, although it showed some drops across multiple ones of the recovery methods, none of the data was found to be significant. An example of this would be in the active recovery group and the cold water or contrast therapy group. They found slower running times, right? They found slowing runner times across all the groups, but it's just how when we're working out like statistical analyses on these kind of tests, slower times don't necessarily mean or like a difference in the, the speed or the difference in the magnitude or difference in delta that we'd find across groups. You really can't look at these and understand straight away, okay, this method is better or that method is worse you really do have to wait for the statistical analysis and then see. The next thing then is the catecholamines and the hormone markers. So testosterone, cortisol, then your catecholamines are your kind of classic neurotransmitters. So epinephrine, norepinephrine, 
and dopamine. Well, you look at these things, as Gurf mentioned earlier, there are certain markers in the blood that will give you an idea of fatigue or of muscle breakdown. So what we're looking for when we look at testosterone is you'd like to see certain uh, recovery protocols increasing testosterone or stunting the drop in testosterone when you're when you're using them. So ideally, you'd see like cold water immersion therapy, an increase in testosterone or less of a decrease in testosterone than you'd see in the other groups. Unfortunately, that's not what we find here. So across all of these markers, cortisol included, we don't see any significant changing or improvement in these markers with the use of any of our therapies uh, or with the use of active recovery when compared to those therapies. What we find is some interesting markers, right? So we have a significant increase in epinephrine and norepinephrine in our cold water immersion groups. That's to be expected. If I was to grab this syringe of epinephrine and jab it into the side of my leg, what will happen? My blood pressure will go through the roof. My heart rate will go through the roof. I'll start breathing incredibly heavily. If I was to jump into a tank of cold water, what would happen? Well, something very, very similar to this kind of stress response would happen. So when we see a, a jumping of epinephrine and norepinephrine like that, it's not really surprising. But when we look at our comparison there, if we look at epinephrine, norepinephrine, and what they do when we're exercising, all of these things have regulatory roles. So if I'm exercising, there are certain things that are happening which could be seen to be uh, damaging to the body. So something like thermal regulation is really, really important. So if I'm exercising, you will see an increase in the level of like, 5-HT, you'll also see an increase in dopamine. What happens when we get fatigued is that ratio of 5-HT to epinephrine changes significantly. It's what they kind of theorize or hypothesize the feelings of fatigue to be associated with. So when we look at our markers here and we don't see any major changing in our levels of epinephrine, our levels of norepinephrine or dopamine in the blood, we can kind of get a fairly good idea that things aren't really changing on a significant level with our neurotransmitters. The last thing to note on these kind of blood serum level uh, hormone tests is that in every test where we were sub submerged in water, so every test except the African recovery group, we saw a decrease in testosterone. Obviously, testosterone is, is inherently useful in the recovery process, so it's not ideal that water immersion significantly decreased our testosterone levels. Muscle soreness is the next thing. Uh, muscle soreness was taken with a, a simple questionnaire. So how sore are your muscles? They took it across multiple time periods. Pretty interesting finding here, right? So muscle soreness was significantly higher in the active recovery group after 60 minutes. So the group that didn't do a cold water immersion, that just sat in an empty bath, they still they just did their 10 minutes of cycling post-exercise, they had significantly higher levels of muscle soreness uh, when compared with the groups that did all the other water immersion protocols. Creatine kinase then is a very important uh, metric to look at when we're talking about muscle soreness. What you'll typically see is a logarithmic increase in creatine kinase associated with that increase in muscle soreness. So as our muscle soreness goes up, our creatine kinase level is usually seen to be exponentially increased uh, due to fatigue or due to muscle damage or whatever is causing it. So when we see this increase in muscle soreness that's associated with um, our, our use of active recovery versus our use of a water immersion therapy, there was an associated increase in, in creatine kinase, as you would expect. But the increase in creatine kinase was not significant. So when they did the statistical analysis, it wasn't significant, but the muscle soreness increase was. The next thing then, moving on from our feelings of muscle soreness, is our perceived relaxation. So how relaxed do you feel? This data was collected using the POMS questionnaire, which anybody who's looked into any bit of psychology would be very, very familiar with. It's a an extensive 65 question questionnaire or something similar to that. They asked them all the questions, collected all the data, but they only looked at feelings of relaxation. So my feeling here, and, and Owen kind of mirrored this earlier when he looked, he talked about the uh, eccentric testing not being published, is that there is data held within here somewhere that like you get a lot of feelings of uh, like our complete kind of emotional state here or that isn't published. So I'd be interested to see the rest of this data, but there is a significant uh, improvement in 
in feelings of relaxation when they're using a water immersion therapy. These levels of significance were found to be higher in the cold water immersion and the contrast water therapy group than they were found to be in the active uh, recovery group and as well the thermo neutral recovery group. So it appears from this that there is some importance in the the temperature and that kind of shock factor when we go into cold water, especially if that water is then combined with a, a an increased temperature afterwards. So to the start discussion with this one, I think there's some problems with the paper and maybe some problems kind of with papers as a whole in terms of sports science. So the kind of first one, we weren't given the isometric leg data. Uh, they didn't publish that at all and the results didn't include it. They didn't really give a reason why, so it's just kind of odd, I suppose. They also didn't give the actual numbers of the 30 meter sprint, which is something that is kind of, it's kind of touches on the value of, of p-values and why a lot of journals don't use p-values right now. So if we look at the study, right, they said that there was no significant difference between the group that did active recovery in terms of their running, but there was an effect size. So something happened, right? So they didn't return to baseline. But the other groups then, in terms of the all the other therapies, seem to have had returned to baseline, basically had no difference, right? So, th- so the value they're putting on that is that they're saying nothing really significant happens. But I suppose if you put this in context, so me, myself and Fitz were talking about this, we we're kind of looking at it it's like, well, the statistical analysis of this says nothing happens. Given the context, it looks like something happened, but we can't say. And I suppose this is the problem as a whole with all of these kind of temperature recovery papers, right? So if you're to look at this in context, right, you would say, well, if they didn't recover the baseline, but all the others did, so it looks like the others were recovering. But then, you know, what were the values on this? So if we're looking at something like um, the 30 meter sprint times, right? So we didn't get the numbers of those. So if they were running 30 meter sprint times in... 15 seconds say or whatever a random number and then that that was their baseline and then after active recovery they were running sprints in 18 seconds so maybe that mightn't be statistically different for the values they put on it but if you're looking at this from in terms of just looking at athletes running if someone's three seconds slower below baseline but then if they did these active recovery or these contrast therapy techniques or hot water or cold water and they did get recovery to baseline you'd say well there's certainly something going on there so i think this kind of touches on the problem with the temperature recovery papers as a whole is that at basically at this stage there's so many of those done and they're incredibly conflicting some people get great not great results but they get positive results other people get no results and then some people get negative results and there's a lot of these done at this stage for saunas hot colds i think really at this stage what is needed is not so much um kind of test retest scenarios over short term what really we would need in the kind of sports science community or our strength conditioning community is we did like a long-term analysis of some very, very quality athletes over a long period of time going through some intense training. So we'd need something like in the region of 12 to 16 week training block, you know, 20, 30 talented athletes were able to dedicate time to training. Now, of course, this is just an ideal scenario. We're not talking about the practicality of this, but ideally what we see is then, and they implementing these recovery techniques consistently. So one group not doing it one group doing you know hot and cold contrast another group doing no or kind of cold therapy or whatever for a prolonged period of time like that's really was the beneficial that would be really beneficial to us right now at this stage i think any more kind of test retest scenarios aren't really giving us any extra data it's just continuing to muddy the water we're not really seeing any significant results from these but what you'd want to see is there are long-term adaptions you know is there do people so we know for example when we see sauna therapy sports science kind of we see sauna we see that it negatively impacts people and that makes sense because the sauna is fatiguing but does this incur positive changes like do you have an additional or do you have changes in your super compensation phase after a long-term training so if you habituate to sauna or you implement it intelligently and then once your long-term program le- done was let's say you're doing 16 weeks and you had some quality athletes would they have better results does it affect negatively or positively their training i think that's the big point from this i think is that we really need to see more longer term effects of these therapies because the weird thing is they're incredibly popular across you know i'm watching eddie halls renovating his house yesterday and he's like implementing multiple different pools like an infinity pool he's getting you know loads of other recovery shit or whatever you want to call it and there seems there must be something there given the prevalence of hot and cold therapies but what it is no one's really sure i think the final point in this is there is a lot to be said for things feel nice, you know, massages, 
for example, don't seem to have any, you know, again, empirical effect in terms of sports science, but fucking hell, they feel nice. So a lot of people do feel better after water therapy. And I feel in some cases, I think that's enough. So if you do it after training session or on a rest day, before another rest day or before a light session, I think you can kind of justify it at the moment. Certainly, if some of them do negatively impact you, they do fatigue you. But I think there's enough sometimes to say, you know, you feel better after doing them. And I think there's a lot of value in that for athletes who train a lot and do train particularly hard. Yeah, as Owen was saying, right, there's there's something going on with recovery techniques where they feel better. And like for me, brain chemistry is the is the backbone about why things might feel better. And, and studying brain chemistry is the reason or the maybe possibly one of the methods we're going to figure out what recovery methods work better for the feelings of, of recovery. So I talked earlier about like 5-HT, so serotonin and its its influence or its interplay with dopamine. So when we exercise, dopamine is increased. Obviously, there's epinephrine and norepinephrine are, are produced. We heard in the paper about like norepinephrine and epinephrine, which is basically what most people call adrenaline. We heard about how that was increased with certain recovery protocols. What I'd like to see is, rather than a study looking at loads of different markers, I'd like to see a study that really focuses on neurotransmitters that gets a lot of of multiple data points. So across a good few time domains, this was, I think it might have been two or three different testing periods. I'd like to see testing periods at in excess of 10 or 15 across two or three days and see this alteration in those catecholamines. So see what's happening with brain chemistry. See what's happening in terms of CNS fatigue and our CNS recovery. And then see, okay, if we're using something like the POMS or the POMS2, which is profile of mood state, how are those findings with our neurotransmitters being transferred across into how we self-report our feelings, right? So do we have an apparent or a visual change in our neurotransmitter levels? Do we have that alteration in our ratio to serotonin to dopamine, like that 5-HT to DA? Do we have that ratio changing? And then does that come across in our self-reported values? I think if we started seeing things like that, we'd have a a much more solid idea of what recovery techniques are actually doing. Because in a lot of the papers, like we've read probably well over 100 of these recovery technique papers in the last 12 months, right? And a lot of the time it comes out as, okay, no performance outcomes no major physiological outcomes that we can report on or statistically significant physiological outcomes, but people felt better. And I think when we when we look at this, it's very easy to get someone to do a POMS or one of these uh, well-known questionnaires and say like, okay, they felt better. Uh, it appears as though they feel better, but we need to start looking at, okay, we know what regulates our feelings, right? Although we might think that brain of ours is completely unique and that the feelings we have are are completely unique to us. It's not. It, it's controlled by chemicals the same way everything else is. So if we understood how those chemical rates decay or the alteration in those rates changes with certain recovery techniques, we'd have a much better idea rather than it always being this kind of self-reported data. The second thing then I'd like to say is like it relates directly to that self-reported data uh, I mentioned earlier the POMS having like 65 different questions, right? And it does. POMS works across a broad range of so its profile of mood states. It basically looks at things like your feelings of vigor, your feelings of depression, your feelings of confusion, your feelings of anger, and your feelings of fatigue. So when we see a questionnaire like that being administrated to a test group, like we know, we know the findings, we know exactly what a graph return for a POMS test should be. We know how the bars should track. We know roughly what the slope of that line is going to be when we see people recovering from exercise. Yet they only report on feelings of relaxation. Feelings of relaxation which aren't directly reported by the POMS. Like uh, my assumption with the use of the POMS is that they're looking at something like the feelings of fatigue and the recovery or the alteration in that feeling of fatigue pre and post exercise. So if you have somebody who reports a not at all fatigued uh, before exercise, a majorly fatigued post-exercise, and then 24 hours after, they're back down to moderately. I assume what they're referring to there is a feeling of relaxation. Uh, 
but we don't know because that's not what the POMS measures. So the use of these self-reported uh, questionnaires, as I said earlier, hugely in inter-individual. My feeling of being very, very fatigued is probably going to be incredibly dissimilar uh, to Owen's feeling of being very, very fatigued. Uh, and his feeling of being very fatigued will be very dissimilar from the next person. So I don't think using something like the POMS or using any kind of self-reported measure is really something we should look to do as like the main finding of our paper. And if we look at the the reporting of this paper and we look at the writing of it, the only significant finding they had is that there was a, a significant finding in the feelings of relaxation. And that finding was found with a questionnaire that didn't actually measure feelings of re relaxation. They inferred their findings from that. And it's a self-reported questionnaire when they had loads of actual physiological data. So we need to start kind of doing better here, tying in those feelings with the neurotransmitter levels we'd associate them with in the blood. And yeah, I think overall, like these questionnaires are hugely valuable. I'm not going to be the one to say no paper should use them. But we need to start looking in the same way where we look at creatine kinase and we link it across with that logarithmic line where we see muscle soreness and creatine kinase. We need to start looking at the same things here in terms of feelings of fatigue or feelings of vigor and the levels of neurotransmitters we have present. I hope you liked today's video. As always, if you want to find more videos like this, just go and check out our channel. We have loads of videos there. There's a new paper review every Monday. If you want to check out, we have reaction videos. We have sports psychology videos, training vlogs. We have theory of training videos. Go back and check out some of the, the past catalogs. If you want more long-term discussions, go and check out our podcast. It's the Seek a Strand podcast and it's linked below. And we also have the Seek a Shit Talk podcast, which is me and Owen talking about anything and everything except sports performance, basically. If you want to hear about coaching and consultancy, go and click the link below. That's the first one in the description and that will bring you to our website. Uh, and thanks very much for watching.